Okay, I see two hands. You're going to go first, your second, your third, your fourth. Go ahead. There were two things that were uh, demonstrably absent. I can't hear you. Is there a roaming, a roamer? Okay, two things that were demonstrably absent from my talk. From your talk. Yes. And I wondered why we didn't discuss the possibility of class action litigation. The second would be, what are we doing with our idiotic politicians? I can think of a few things. <laughs> but, I'm, but it's G-rated here. Um, so when I look at, I'm a strategist in a community. You know, I, I came into this whole thing as like, I want a solution. And if you look at all the things that we can do, Court, court, court system is one of them. And then you have things like Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, who used to be Monsanto's attorney, and you have, um, I mean, I can just list all these things, a guy that, that struck down a class action against Monsanto when the New York Times later outed him as a former attorney of record on, for Monsanto, never admitted it, never accused himself. And you could spend a fortune and many years in lawsuits and not win. I'm not against lawsuits. Steve Drucker's lawsuit forced them to give us thousands of documents even though the, the judge had to do backflips in order to deny his, his motion. You know, they had to just, as the, the strained logic is what he described. So I'm not against that. And it's part of the bigger picture. But in looking at what is the most effective way where we have the power and don't give it away and to a judge or anything else and we know we'll win, that's the market-based strategy. Yeah. I support court cases. I'm interviewed by lawyers all the time who are going to, going to do class actions and whatnot for lost export markets, etc. As far as politicians go, Obama's been worse than the Bush administration on GMOs. Um, Michael Taylor was put back in the FDA by the Obama administration. Um, all these people were put into, eight, eight people were put into Obama's administration or um, proposed for the Supreme Court by him, all related to the biotech industry and their support. Um, I realize that, you know, when, when going forward in this, you know, they've got billions of dollars, we've got $1.95, how do we fight them? And Washington seemed like it was a little too expensive. What happened in Europe and what happens a lot is that the politicians follow the market, follow the people. Um, so in terms of this labeling thing, for example, which is an example of a policy change plan, there's ballot initiatives in four states to get labeling. We failed on all four. The other side spent $100 million lying to people, saying they were gonna spend more money if it, pa if it passes. It increased the awareness of GMOs, but I think the messaging was poor. It just said right to know, and that didn't really convince anyone to not eat it. So the whole tipping point thing suffered on the opportunity cost. But for labeling, we actually need the SIP tipping point because if it passed in California, the FDA would probably just preempt it like they did with restaurant menu labeling and say, we want labeling too. And we're gonna have it so that it's not a patchwork of regulations from state to state so we're going to deny states the right to require labeling and put a national labeling strategy in place eventually. And that eventuality may be nothing, like it was with the restaurant menu labeling, or it may depend on the nature of the negotiation table in Washington, which has Monsanto on one side, consumers on the other, and the, cons and the food industry with Monsanto. Now what if there's a tipping point and they all remove GMOs? Where are they in the in the table. They're no longer scared of mandatory labeling. In fact, they may be in favor of it because to avoid a mandatory label may be easier than putting a non-GMO label on there. So now we have the grocery manufacturers on our side and the political will to support an industry that has just been kicked out of the United States is also depleted. So the politicians will be less likely to take up Monsanto's cause if all the food companies just got rid of their food. So with that tipping point, post tipping point negotiation table, then the FDA or the next administration may come and say, okay, we're gonna do mandatory labeling. So even for the mandatory labeling, the tipping point rules. The tipping point is essential if 
the FDA is going to do what it's mandated to do, which is to promote GMOs. That's its instruction for the last 20 years, to promote GMOs. So I still think consumer education is primary. I understand the cafeteria at Monsanto and the cafeteria at Capitol Hill only serves organic and they do not serve GMO food. Is that true? I've never heard about Capitol Hill. Here's what I heard. That when Obama took office in the White House, that re we revealed, it revealed that um, the Bush administration was 100% organic in the White House and Laura Bush insisted on it. And then we assumed that Obama was following the course. In 1999, Adrian Bebb, I think of Friends of the Earth, sent an email out, or not an email at that time, a letter out to different food uh, managers of restaurants, including the restaurant in the headquarters of Monsanto in Europe, in England, saying, do you serve GMOs? And the manager of the restaurant in Monsanto's headquarters said, because of consumer concern, because of our customer's concern, we've removed GMOs. <laughs> <laughs> we know that a former Monsanto scientist told me that three of his colleagues who studied the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone found so much cancer-promoting hormone in the milk, the three Monsanto scientists stopped drinking milk unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. I don't think... Oh, it's working good. Um, there is an app called B-U-Y-C-O-T-T on the cell phone, yeah, yeah. which uh, for the Grocery Manufacturers Association, if the food is made by them, the app will tell you when you scan the barcode. Right, so there's a boycott or boycott application. My feeling about boycotts are this. A lot of times boycotts are principled, you know, help the farm workers, help this, help that. I feel a more potent strategy is, you want to eat that? You know, like, you, you want to turn your intestinal floor into living pesticide factories? You really want to eat that corn chip? And it's, it's a it's not a boycott that's a traditional sense. It's like preserve your life decision. So it becomes a boy, it become, has the same impact. It's market driven campaigning, but it doesn't rely on someone to understand an issue and then resist eating something which they're attracted to because of that principle. It's resisting eating something because it's now an FSO, it's a food shaped object, and it's no longer in their list of actual edibles. Who has the, there you have it, go ahead. First, thank you very much for sharing all the information you have shared today. I love it. Um, but I have a question. For your average 20-year-old college student that, you know, works and may not have the best budgeting skills ever, um, when he goes to the grocery store and there's the non-GMO food and then there's the organic food and there's the non-GMO and organic food, which one do you think he should go for, you know, if he only has, say, $5 in his pocket and can only pick one of the three? So you mean, you mean conventional, non-GMO, organic, or the combination of non-GMO and organic? Yes. Well, the combination is the, is the best. It says non-GMO project verified and organic. Here's the difference. Um, non-GMO project verified requires testing. If you use corn or soy or sugar, whatever, sugar beets, it requires testing to verify that you're either absent or below the threshold of 0.9% on a regular basis. Organic does not allow the use of GMOs, but they have no test requirements. So there may be some contamination. So if you have non-GMO verified plus organic, that's the gold standard. If you had to choose between non-GMO verified and organic, they both may end up with contamination, just so you know. But because glyphosate and Roundup is sprayed on wheat, barley, rye, etc., I'd go for the organic. Because then you not only avoid the GMOs, you avoid a lot of the other nasties. Um, if you can't afford... Um, organic, um, and you can't find anything that's non-GMO because you live in a food desert, well, there are, some, there are some internet programs that you can get things discounted. You can even just find non-GMO on the shelves of Walmart. You can ragu spaghetti sauce, ragu light, it's got olive oil, ragu chunky has soybean oil and high fructose corn syrup. You just read the ingredients and see, oh, this is non-GMO. It may have other chemicals in it, but it's non-GMO. So, you know, it's... When, because we move around and we don't have a lot of st stability in where we eat all the time, we gotta choose the best option for ourselves. So knowing all these little tricks, going out to eat, which is, I've traveled nine months last year, eight months the year before, I have to know how to order. What kind of oil do you cook in? Always ask that question. If it's soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil, I say, do you have any olive oil here? If they say they cook in olive oil, say, is it a blend? Because they'll say olive oil and it's half canola or 80% canola. So you ask that. 
Same with the salad dressing. Those are the invisible ones that, they, that are not listed. Mostly you can tell visible ones like zucchini and yellow squash is at risk, corn on the cob, polenta, etc. The invisible ones are the sugar, things like that. Who has the microphone over here? You do? Okay. Uh, you answered it, but uh, just clarify. If it says organic, it's not necessarily non-GMO? If it says organic, it's not allowed to use GMOs. If it's, yes. There's three ways, right. there's four ways that organic can be listed on the product. It can say 100% organic, it could say organic, which means at least 95%, or it could say made with organic ingredients or organic soybeans, which means at least 70%. The rest of it, the other 30% or 5%, all have to be non-GMO. So if it says made with organic soybeans, it's all supposed to be non-GMO. If it doesn't say organic anywhere on the label except in the ingredient panel, then it doesn't tell you about anything else. You can say organic soybeans, but the canola oil might be GMO. So if you don't see it on the front of the package, read the ingredients to see if there's any at-risk ingredients. So it's supposed to be non-GMO. It doesn't have to be tested to verify. Someone over here, yes. I Oh. First of all, thank you so much for, for all work you've done. And thank you for today's presentation and for giving us this optimistic uh, belief that it will, we will win. Okay? But my question is how technically it's possible because so much produce already spoiled, so much uh, soil already like damaged. Uh, what they will do, all, what all this um, producer will do with all this food and soil, will they send it to third world countries uh, like vaccine before? What will happen? Just like, and how fast right. it could? So to transition from non-organic to organic, you need three years for the field. To transition from GMO to non-GMO, immediate. You just plant non-GMO seeds. You harvest GMO, plant non-GMO. You should probably plant a different type of crop because the volunteer un, ungerminated, unharvested seeds can come up and contaminate. So if you plant canola that's GMO canola one year and you plant non-GMO canola, for the next 16 years you can have more than 1% contamination. But, so you plant something else. Now, the soil is damaged from Roundup. And Roundup the longest recorded half-life, meaning the period of time it takes to degrade to half its quantity, the longest recorded half-life of glyphosate in soil is 22 years. It can also degrade in months. It depends on the soil conditions. There are people who are working hard every season to find remedies for the soil. And I've heard there's some good news there. I don't know the details, but I'm confident that they'll figure out some solution, perhaps some biology added to the soil. I think if we all of a sudden went 100% non-GMO today, there's not enough seed available for the farmers. So our five-year plan understands that and goes for food first and animal feed second. And that'll give them time to transition and that's also probably what's going to happen. There'll be more pressure on human food than in animal feed. And it's just a question of substituting the non-GMO seeds for it growing the non-GMO seeds in Hawaii or South America or whatever, while they're, you know, it's not difficult. The problem is you're going to end up still with some level of contamination for as long as corn and soy exist, but that level of contamination will become less and less and less as all the new inputs of seed is non-GMO. So you, to, trusting, to trust the non-GMO project, you have to, in order to get verified, you have to submit your testing um, results, you're testing your sampling protocol. And if, you're, if you have detectable GMOs in the final product and you're trying to lie, you really are stupid because if someone could just pull it off the market, pull it off the shelf, test it, and if you turn out to be high and you're verified as low and you're lying, you can destroy your brand reputation forever. I mean, you know what happened to Kashi? You know, Kashi was... We're healthy. It was bought by Kellogg's and it didn't pay any attention to the GMOs. The soy in Kashi was 100% GM soy. So there was a big social media thing. USA Today picked it up. They scrambled frantically, lost a lot of market share. Now they're going non-GMO. 
Who has the microphone on their side? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I think that you've changed my life. Oh, thank you. No one has convinced me why I should buy organic. So even when I've been three times to Whole Foods and the people here, I said, I have blueberries, I have raspberries. And then, are they organic? And I thought, what's the big deal? I'll just go home and wash them. So you've really altered my thinking. So thank you for that. Thank Here's you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of freaking out a little. <laughs> um, it's just really making me be mindful. I've never really thought about this before. Okay. And what, may, may, I, may I add this, though? After switching to, I would go cold turkey, 100% organic immediately. Just try 100%. That's my recommendation. But I his, his I, hold, on, hold on, let me just, let me finish. I wouldn't ease into it if you can because now you just came off this course. You want to dive in. So go 100% okay. and then take notes in your mind. In, well, written I've down. written every word down that you said. No, no, but I say take notes about your health. Okay. All right? Notice the change. Notice if your energy level gets better, your sleep cycle, your everything. I will. And the thing is, that's what's going to be really convincing to you and to your good friends. Because, you know, there's the theory and then there's the life energy that rushes through you when you get real good food. Like, so, I can't wait to call my kids and hand them all the notes. I've taken notes on everything. But I had someone leave, a, leave a, a lecture texting their kids saying, don't eat any more GM food. The son texted back, what's wrong with General Motors? <laughs> <laughs> Here's my one question. Okay, sure. I am going to follow this, but like take bananas and oranges and fruits that are in a skin or pomegranates. It's still not, they still have to be totally organic too? I don't know. I don't know if they're sprayed by what they're sprayed with. I don't know if the spray, see what the problem is this. The, I don't think the Environmental Working Group, which has that list, focuses on glyphosate because the, the USDA does not do any testing for glyphosate. So we want to initiate testing. That's part of our plan. We're raising money for it. We want to be able to answer that question. So I don't know. So Sorry. you're saying don't take any chances, go organic. I would say if you can afford it, and I would say I would move some of your budget into what the food budget. What about for my dog? What about dog food? I don't I would know go organic with, now. I'd go organic with the dog food and watch the energy level. I interviewed a, 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 um, Thank you. I interviewed, interviewed a vet three days ago, and he said, it's like the, the dogs are so tired. The dogs and cats are so tired. They switch to organic, and they're like puppies again. Yeah, so you'll, that'll be convincing. Someone has a, 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 here. I think this is working. Okay, I wanted to thank you also. Thank you very much. Um, I've been following the GMO just movement uh, for the past three years because I got very sick, and um, I was just floored as to what's out there and what we're eating and how sick it's making us. Um, I did ask this the other night. I just wanted to know if, if you had some in, insight on it. I read an article that, that labeling is going to change in the USDA where organic will include some GMOs. No. Is organic is not going to include any GMOs uh, at this point. There's no intention of that. There's no expectation of that. When they were originally folding the organic program into a USDA oversight program, they wanted to include GMOs, sewer sludge, and irradiation, and they got swamped with over 300,000 letters, and that's sacred. Um, so I don't believe that there's any GMOs allowed. Now, if someone has information other than that, let me know. Steve's over there. If he has any information, to let me know. Um, so I don't believe that there's any GMOs uh, that are illegally allowed, but sometimes, you know, sometimes the inspector won't necessarily ask about the soy lecithin in a minor ingredient. It doesn't mean that it's not part of the law, okay. not part of the, the standards. Uh, right, I've got 10 seconds left. Okay, just my next question is, was you, ha you had said that 70% of let's say a produce is organic, but it might have some contamination? No, what I'm saying is if a label says made with organic blank, then it has to contain at least 70% organic ingredients. Okay. But the other 30% have to be non-GMO. What about produce? I'm produce. talking about okay. cucumbers, tomatoes. So here's the good news on the produce. In the produce section, here are the following risks in a produce section. Zucchini, yellow squash, papaya, if it's from Hawaii or China, Corn on the cob, edamame. And if they sell tofu in the produce section, tofu. That's it. No other, at this point, 
No other fruits or vegetables are genetically engineered today and commercialized. Apples and potatoes, apples may appear later this year, potatoes may appear next year, but right now, if you cook from scratch and you buy produce, this is the same answer to those that, make, that have their own gardens. Those are the seeds to look out for. But that's the good news. So China is very pivotal. We just, we're trying to raise money for a program to make genetic roulette available to the Chinese-speaking people. Um, I've been to China three times, and um, it's now, it's USDA, is, it's USDA, it's Department of Agriculture, is now sensitive to public opinion. In public opinion, we have found that the most impactful tool we've ever studied and tested for changing someone's opinion on GMOs is the movie, Genetic Roulette. Testing people before and after in the same way we tested you. You know, rate yourself from one to 100. Absolutely consistent. So we have it dubbed in Chinese and we want to introduce that throughout China online for free, supported by American dollars to help us. And the thing is, if they say no to the potato or the apple, it may not be commercialized here. Because Syngenta introduced a corn here that was not accepted in China. China rejected genetically, rejected all corn shipments for months, costing one to two billion dollars. Syngenta got sued by 180 farmers in the United States. Companies are not willing to put out a product in the United States that could interfere with U.S. exports to China. So if we can stop China from, improve, from approving 2,4-D Agent Orange crops that are engineered not to be killed by being sprayed with a component of Agent Orange, that's been delayed until China approves it or not. So that's one of our international gambits. That's, that's where we have to go with government policy, you know. Can't just deal with it on the, on, the, on the consumer level, but we think because they're paying attention to consumer opinion, we might have a big influence on the policy levels in China. All right, we are ending now. So I want to give you, I, I never know what I'm going to say at the end, but I always say, let me end with this, and then I figure out what I'm going to say. Let me say this. Uh, we're going to be giving a talk tonight at the, at the panel. It'll be Steve Drucker, Claire Cummins, and myself. We're going to be going into more, uh, we'll be able to answer more of your questions. But this is, it's, I would say, I'm going to comment on what I said before. Make your decision now. You've just heard the information. It will only get less in its influence. So don't put off the decisions. You've already, some of you made a decision to be more vigilant at avoiding, more vigilant at getting the word out. So make your, you have a half an hour break. Make your plans, how you want to get the word out, how you want to put your footprint on protecting all living beings and all future generations. And the next time I come here, it'll be a celebration lap. Yay.